Yeah, I'm on the earth to make this. So, uh, laptop HDMI. HDMI lap. Got to click the projector button. Now, is it going to be clear? Might Maybe. Lower the lights. Yes. That's. Uh, not over there. Then it is over there. there. John. Clever. So, we're just going to push for semi. How's that? Less, more dark, less dark? I'll take that as good. Do we, need, uh, do we need to zoom in? Can everyone see, like in the back? Is that legible? Yeah. All right, here we go. You have to click on the window. Man. Oh, I wasn't clicked in. Is that good? Better? More? A little bit more. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, all right, legible now. What about the terminal? Output. Uh, you have to right click and zoom in on that. Oh god. Oh, uh, right click on the status bar. Oh, I have to Mac. Yeah, well, on our right click on the status bar. <laughs> Not that I can zoom in on my terminal or anything. <laughs> so that's not looking too promising. Yeah. Is that worse? Yeah. What? Crazy. Yeah. All right, good stuff. All right, so this is pointer basics right here. Um, so just show of hands, who knows what a pointer is? Okay, so half the class, more or less. Class. <laughs> Most Group. <of> people. <laughs> yeah, class. Uh -huh. So. Uh, the very basic idea of what a pointer is, is that uh, it uh, is a location in memory of where you're storing another variable. So let's start walking through the code. Hopefully, we all know what an integer is, right? Okay. Uh, and that integer you can see is holding the value of the line. But, um, you know, that integer doesn't just like exist free floating in space. When you're running your program, that integer has to be somewhere. Uh, and it's located somewhere in memory. Your, uh, the program will store every variable, whatever, everything that you have somewhere in memory. And uh, sometimes we need to know where uh, that location is in memory. Uh, so uh, the way to access a variable in memory, see the location where it's located, is the ampersand. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I'll run through this executable after I finish talking through the program, but... That's kind of going to be the form. We're going to like walk through the code and then we'll actually execute it and talk about the output of, of what we wrote and stuff, but first, yeah, we're just walking through it. Okay, so, um, just who can tell me what an asterisk after a variable uh, type does? Anybody? Kurt? No, no, you. Does that make that, like, that variable... Yes, absolutely. So when you look at this variable ptr, it is not an int. It is an int pointer or a pointer to an integer. Um, so what you can do with a pointer to an integer is assign it not to a numeric value, but to the address of an integer. So this is an int pointer, and we are assigning the address of my int to int pointer. So now when you print out uh, PTR, what do you think it's going to look like? Weird memory addresses. Exactly. And uh, then, of course, once you've got that weird memory address, well, what are you going to do with it? I mean, no one's just going to read memory that's useless to us uh, for people reading. So uh, what we have is the dereference or indirection operator, the asterisk. So the asterisk, asterisk does two things. When you put it after a type, it makes it a pointer. When you put it be before a variable, it dereferences the pointer or uh, gives you the information that that pointer is pointing to rather than the address in memory. So, time to compile. Oh, no. Don't remind me. Then, when we run this program, it goes to a.out by default, yeah. right? Okay. Oh my god, this trackpad is sticky. <laughs> uh, 
Hopefully we'll be able to see the entire output of the program here. Sensitive. So uh, the first thing we printed out was the address of my int. So you can see that is some weird memory address that doesn't really mean much to us. And then when we assigned PTR to the address of my int, uh, it is the same memory address. So then PTR is pointing to my int. Then when you dereference PTR, it gives you the value stored in my int, which is 5. Are there any questions here, like at all? Yes? Compiler error, I'm sure. Put an asterisk no, it's one of them. Pointer. It gives you, it still gives you the address, but it'll be on the stack. So, well, Wait, what do you, I think it gives you the address. No, no, no. If you try to dereference an integer. Is, oh, yeah, it's an asterisk. I thought you said the so, Sorry. Yeah, we can try it. Um, you said asterisk, right? Yeah. So, Definitely. standard C out uh, and an asterisk my int. Command C. Oh, yeah, right. Command, it's in the wrong place. Why are the people by names? Yeah, <laughs> compiler error. It will not let us dereference an integer. So it's going to statically check to make sure that everything with a dereferencing operator in front of it is actually a pointer, and if it's not, it's really not going to let it happen. But if you didn't, never mind. You already did the ampersand. Okay. Yeah. What's G? G is the uh, new compiler collection compiler for. C++. It's uh, pretty much what everybody uses on Linux. There's also Clang, right? Yeah. As a C++ compiler, but most people are playing. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, so you've probably always done your C++ compiling in a uh, IDE, like Visual Studio or CodeBlocks. If you use CodeBlocks, you should know that Visual Studio is available free to you as part of the UC partnership with Microsoft. So don't use code blocks and with Visual Studio. But you also have the option of using a command line compiler like this. So what it does is it takes G, uh, it's, the command is G++, it takes your C++ file and then you can output it to a file you name, the default is a dot out. And then it runs just like an executable. Um, so who here is on Windows and who here is on a Unix based operating system, so Mac or Linux? So for Windows, let's let's raise your hand if you're Windows junkies. <laughs> okay, it's better than Mac. How about Unix or yeah, some Unix based stuff? Ah, Unix. I thought okay, good, cool. All right. Any more questions on this? Do people understand how the general idea of a pointer works? Awesome. So uh, then we are going to move on to our second example, which is just some. Uh, very simple pointer operations. Um, you know, things you can do with them, assignment, that kind of stuff. Mostly assignment. So start off by declaring some integers, right? We all get that. And then we have three pointers. One of these pointers, or each of these pointers, is pointing to one of the integers, PTR1, pointing to A. You know, you see address of A, PTR2, pointing to B, PTR3, C. Um, and then we're going to print out the uh, values uh, that you get when you dereference the pointer. So just looking at the code, who can tell me what's going to be printed out in this section of code right here? Anybody? Yes. One, two, three. Perfect. Uh, and then let's do some assignments. We set A, the integer that we declared up there, equal to zero. What happens when now when we de uh, dereference PTR1? What does that print out? Uh, no, what, what makes you think one? Yeah. Probably getting this in the next. But we didn't change it. So you're saying we, we changed A, but we didn't change the pointer one? So they're kind of like what the value, the address is value that's stored. So, uh, actually that's incorrect. Well, what PTR is going to do is print out zero. And that's because PTR1 is not holding the value that you saw in A, it's holding the address of A. So uh, when you change the uh, contents of A, um, PTR1, although it doesn't get changed at all, when you dereference it, uh, that memory 
that uh, you have that address that you have inside PTR one now holds zero instead of one initially. Does everybody get that? So when he does change A, technically he is changing that original A. So anything pointing to A is going to have that most up-to-date value. One of the advantages of pointers, really. And in, in this case, I mean, the, the demonstration is so academic that we're not really saving memory. Pointers can kind of allow us to have like some, some really large thing in memory, and we can just have a really small thing over here pointing to the original instead of making a copy. So like if you had int A equals 1 and int B equals A, they're going to be two different values. So if he changes A or changes B, they're going to be changing independently of each other. They're not going to like have the most updated value of, it, of itself. That kind of makes sense. So B is not going to always be kept up to date with A. Pointers allow us to, to make sure that they're all pointing at the same exact data source in memory. So when he does change A, the value at the address of pointer 1 is also going to change because it's really the same thing. And please feel free to ask questions or answer my questions, even if you have no idea if you're going to be right. Uh, your guess helps us uh, start a conversation. Um, so now, second thing we're doing here, what happens when we dereference PTR2 and set that dereference equal to 4? Now, what's gonna, uh, what is the value held in B after that? Any guesses? You shout it out if you want. No shame in being wrong. Four? That's correct. Because, so what we have here is PTR2 is the address in memory where B is held. When we dereference that, what we get is B. And then we set B equal to four, and there it is. Does everyone understand how that works? I guess this is kind of where pointers start to get confusing. So. The key is that they are, they are really both pointing to the exact same true memory location. So like any change at that memory location is going to reflect to anything else pointing at that memory location. So in this case, we've got B, which kind of is that sitting at that memory location. We've got pointer 2, which is somewhere else pointing to that memory location. So any change at that original location is going to be reflected in both B and pointer 2, which is why these can stay with pointer 2. So you can also set, like you did up there, B equal to 6, and then when you dereference pointer 2, you're going to see that updated value as well. And here's probably our most confusing example. I don't know, maybe that was the most confusing. So now we set pointer 3, PTR 3, equal to PTR 2. Now, when you dereference PTR 3, what are you going to see? The value of B. That's correct. Because um, you're not changing, oh, never mind. Uh, I'll get there in a second. What are you going to see when you uh, print out C? What values are in C? C is 3. C is 3. Uh, the, reason, yeah, uh, the reason that C is 3 is because you are, uh, the pointer and the variable are, uh, despite that, despite the fact that the pointer uh, will reflect what gets updated in the variable, they are separate. So when you change what PTR3 is pointing to, you're just kind of taking an arrow from PTR3 to C and flipping that arrow to B. C doesn't actually get changed in any way. We just don't have a pointer to it anymore. So what happens is when you dereference PTR3, you're going to get 4, which is what B is now equal to. And when you print out C, you are still going to see 3. Do people understand how that works? Is there any sort of confusion here? I'm sorry to explain this earlier, but what does the ampersand operator before variable mean do exactly? Uh, the ampersand is the reference operator. It is the opposite of the asterisk uh, when you point it out. Okay. So ampersand gives you the location and memory, whereas asterisk takes you from a location and memory to an actual value. And the locations are just arbitrary, correct? Uh, well, yeah, it's start of the program. Of course, yeah, it can be. Exactly. The location in memory might change every time you execute it. It can, if you're lucky, maybe it'll be the same thing every time. Who knows? Okay. Uh, but it's not something that's legible by people, really. <laughs> um, so, is there any more confusion on anything that happened mm -hmm. in here? If not, I will go through and execute it. Did anybody kind of get the basics 
of the, the pointer operations and stuff like that. Address of, dereference, check reference, stuff like that. Okay, we're going to need a little bit more space for this one. But you can clear it. Just want to clear it. Yeah, you're right. Is anybody confused at all with what you're seeing? Who gets it? Yeah. <laughs> well, not the, I'm, you saw you look at the when we released this repo. Look at the commit messages. I messed up and had to go back and delete something. So do you now know it perfectly? Uh, no, I won't say I know it perfectly. There's still things I mess up. They're tricky. So when we run our program, we see initially when we dereference the pointers, we get you know the values that they were pointing to one, two, and three. Now when we set a equal to zero, since uh, even though the value in a changed, its location did not, and ptr1 is still pointing to the same location, now it just sees, uh, when you dereference it, you see a zero instead of a one. Uh, then with uh, setting b to four, uh, you see star ptr2 equals four, that uh, dereference ptr2 and set the value held in that location to 4, so that changed b to 4, and maybe if I drag it up, oops, oh god, no. Um, okay, well, there we go. Uh, now when we set ptr3 equal to ptr2, since they're going to hold the same location in memory, uh, when we dereference ptr3, it's going to give you the same thing uh, that uh, was held in b and then C was not changed at all. Yes? So why would you want to use it? Um, I'm going to talk that about is a good, that at the end. That's a good We've question. Um, there are lots of reasons to use a pointer. And it, in fact, it's we could have an entire like 10 lectures on that. Um, a common reason to use a pointer is what Dom mentioned earlier. Um, if you have a very large object, which uh, do you have a basic idea of what an object is in C++? C++? Okay, if you have a very, very large object um, in C++, if you try to pass that object to a function, it's going to be very inconvenient. It'll take a long time because it has to create a new copy of that object. Instead, you can give a pointer to the object, and uh, then that way you only have to pass, what is it, uh, four or eight bytes of information uh, to the function instead of who knows, if you have a giant class, it could be multiple kilobytes. I mean, that's ridiculous, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, it's the idea, you know, if you have like a really big house on some street, and you, you can give the address out to any number of people, because the address of any house is going to be really, really small, and anybody can kind of point to the house. It's a much better than giving them a copy of your house every single time you want them to reference something inside your house. Does that kind of make sense? You keep one copy of your house, because copying a house is pretty expensive, right? you got to move it and get it <laughs> And so like, it's really easy to build it once and then just toss out a bunch of pointers or addresses to it um, and then let people just look at your house through the addresses as opposed to build your whole house. It's kind of terrible analogy. Makes sense. And uh, another common reason to use pointers is if you want to make an object mutable in a function. So mutable means you can change it. Uh, so I guess most of you probably know how a function works. If you pass, say, an integer to a function, and then you modify the integer in the function, the original integer doesn't actually change, because when you passed it to a function, you made a copy. I, you'll see that later. But uh, pointers are, can also be used to make objects mutable inside of functions. Uh, since you are not copying the object, you're just telling them where to find the original. Your turn. Cool. So people are people kind of clear on that a little bit. Did I see it? Yeah. Okay. I wonder. Obsessive clear LS. I know. What? Yeah. I've done it and I never stick to it, and so I just keep doing that. Okay. So these are, this is a really simple example. First, I want to go to Python though, really quick. Who has some experience in a high-level language like JavaScript or Python or Ruby? I don't know, just some uh, MATLAB. Yeah, MATLAB is a very yeah, MATLAB. Yeah, MATLAB. 
So um, can someone tell me in Python really quickly what I'm doing right here? Can, can people see that? Probably not, actually. Sure, yeah, I'm creating an array. So, um, yeah, list, I guess, in, in Python. So down here, if I want to print this array, this list out, tell, can someone tell me how to do that? Yeah. Okay, this is Python 3, so it's going to yell at me for prints, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I just didn't remember what it was. So, so if I want to print the value right of this list, what could someone foretell what they're what we're going to see on the right side here? What, what are we going to see? Yeah. So we're going to see one, two, three. Um, oh. Okay. I thought I could just do it over and over. Yeah. So, so this it's the idea that if I want to say array equals seven, eight, nine, ten, if I want to print array or just have it be returned by the interpreter. It's going to give us the entire thing. So if I have n whole elements in this array and I just want to toss around the array, it's going to give me the whole thing every time I use it. In C++, this is a lot different. Um, and that's kind of one of the tricky things. So we talked about the operations you can do with pointers, assignments, and dereferencing, and address of, and stuff like that. Um, pointers have a kind of unique connection to arrays, which is a little weird. So in this case, I just want to talk about the very first line of the main uh, function here. So we have int val equals 10 something that we've all seen before. If I want to see out val, I'm probably going to see 10 in the terminal, right? Or something like that. Um, so, but with the, why is that size 10? Uh, that was confused as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so in C++, if I wanted to define an array, first of all, I have to tell the compiler how big it need, the array is going to be. It needs to know all this stuff at compile time, because uh, it's not, as, as dynamic of a language. So in this case, I say int array, and I can use the bracket operator and pass it some some integer here in this case. Uh, well, yeah, some, some integer of the length. Yes, okay. um, so I'm going to say, I, I'm going to set up an array of four elements, and I'm going to set it equal to, and inside these braces, this is the syntax for C++ arrays, I'm going to say six, seven, eight, and nine. Um, now, in Python, we could just print, or in C++, the analogous, to see out the array, and we just get in brackets six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, whatever it was, the actual value of the array that we thought of when we were assigning it to that variable. But in C++, it's very um, different. So in this case, I want to talk about. I think I wrote this actually pretty wrong. Well. No, no, you have it right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so um, in this case, someone tell me what I'm gonna. See when I see out just the array. Does anybody know kind of what happens in C++ when I do this? What's that? Error. Error? It's actually going to let me do it. Um, so what it's what it's going to say is we're when we're doing this initial assignment, uh, array is actually a pointer. It doesn't look like it because we're not using the pointer um, operator, the the asterisk when we define a type. But that's what the brackets and the integer inside the brackets are going to do. So array is really a pointer to an integer. And then we tell the compiler, OK, we need four spaces for integers. We line them all out contiguously, which means just right back to back uh, on the stack, which we'll talk about the stack later. And that's going to allow me to um, kind of just straight up see what we have, uh, where, where that array exists. So if we print out a pointer, we see the address, right? So in this case, the array keyword, or the array uh, variable, is the address of the first element of the pointer. So if I print out array, I should get the, the address. Um, now the compiler, if I say array plus one, it's going to know what type is inside array. So it's going to say, oh yeah, array plus one. Well, the array has integers. Integer is going to be four bytes. So it's going to move over four bytes and give me the address of the next element in the array. And it's going to let me do that until, well, it's actually you know, kind of let me do that always. But um, I can do that until the very end. So I start out with, this is going to give me the address of the zeroth element right here of six. Array plus one is going to add four bytes, or one size of an int, to the address of the first element, which is going to give me the address of seven, or the yeah, the zero of the first element. And then when I plus two, it's just going to keep indexing forward. This is kind of called, this is the idea of pointer arithmetic, where I can add values to a pointer, and the compiler is going to kind of extrapolate how far to go in memory based off of the type that that pointer is of. Does that kind of make sense? So array is a pointer to an int. So if I add one thing to that address, it's going to say, oh, shift over one int, because what's after it must be an int also. Um, 
And I can do that while I'm in the balance of the array. Unfortunately, I can also go outside the balance of the array and do some sneaky stuff, but we're not going to be doing that um, So Zach talked about the dereferencing operator as well. So I can put the asterisk in front of something when I'm using it or printing it out, and that's going to allow me to go to the address and then get the value of the item at that address. And that's, so we've seen that the brackets operator up here kind of acts as that asterisk, as, uh, asterisk right? Because it doesn't look like I'm making array a pointer but the brackets make, makes array a pointer to that array. Um, the same is actually on the opposite end too. So just like we can use the asterisk to dereference a, a variable, we can use the brackets operator to dereference um, the variable as well, a pointer. So in this case, I want the, the first thing I ever put in the array. So that's gonna be at the zeroth index. I think everybody's familiar with zero base indexing and stuff like that. So array zero is actually gonna give me the value of the first thing in the array. So I should be getting six. Is this kind of clear to everybody why this is happening? So it's the same thing as basically saying star array because it's going to dereference the bracket. When I'm using a value, it's going to let us dereference that address and get the value. <coughs> so in this case, I've stored the uh, integer six there and it's gonna let me, let me see it. Um, so I talked about how we could use asterisk array in this case, right? Um, to get the value at the first element of the array. Um, so how would I do that if I wanted to keep indexing? Well, we are, we've already seen array plus one doesn't just add like one to the address. It actually shifts me over one full type of whatever that pointer was. So I want to shift over to the next integer address in that array, and that's what that's going to give me. So if I wanted to dereference the value at the next address, I would just have to wrap this into a... Um, or wrap, wrap this in parens and put an asterisk around it, which is exactly what I'm doing here. The reason the parens are here is because if I just did asterisk array, that's gonna be computed before the plus one. So it's actually gonna say asterisk array six plus one, it's gonna give me seven. So it's actually, you know, in this example, it's gonna look like it worked because these, these are in ascending order, so that's probably not ideal. <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> I just caught that. But uh, yeah, the idea is that the brackets operator is going to be doing the same thing as dereferencing and then shifting over by a single type. So we don't have to tell the compiler, oh yeah, move over four bytes. No, we just want it to move over one element. And that's going to say, oh yeah, the element is subtyped in. We'll shift over four bytes. And array plus one is going to be the address. If I want to dereference the value at that address, I just put the dereferencing operator in front of it. So it's kind of, this example is demonstrating the fundamentals of the dereferencing operator and how the bracket operator is kind of doing the same thing under the hood. It seems a little nuanced and a little confusing because it's like, well, if I didn't use the dereferencing operator and Zach told me to use the dereferencing operator, what do I do? But it's like, it's really using that under the hood. And then I can, of course, could just keep indexing um, like normal to the array with valid indices. I can even run off the array. Uh, is that undefined behavior running off? Uh, it's either undefined or a seg fault if it's oh, yeah. null that, pointer. Yeah, it's null pointer. Um, so yeah, is everybody, is everybody kind of clear on, on this? Adding something to a pointer is the idea of pointer arithmetic. I'm just basically saying move over one space, one type uh, in memory, and that's going to let me do that, and then of course I can use the dereference operator at that point. And that's pretty much, again, what the brackets is doing. It's allowing us to get, kind of get rid of this nasty syntax where it's like, hey, start at the beginning of the array, shift one element, and give me the value here. It's gonna really just do that uh, under the hood with the brackets operator. People kind of clear on what that is, okay. So let's go through, uh, we'll compile it. Do you have anything to add, Zach? Um, so I guess just the general idea of how an array works is that the uh, variable, the array, is a pointer to the first element in the array. And once you understand that, you've basically got it. Yeah, it's, it's not incredibly intuitive because as we saw in other languages, you can kind of just print an array and it gives you all the values that we originally intended for that array to hold. But in this case, um, since th the way the compiler deals with contiguous memory chunks, it gives us an address and then lays everything out. Um, and that's why, since, since it's laying everything out like that in the stack, it requires us to kind of declare all this stuff up, up front. Um, so in this case, I'm going to uh, execute the compiled version of this. This is nice. <coughs> I was lucky. <laughs> and uh, so if I execute this, let's see, I should see the, the value of val in this case right here is going to be 10. 
Um, and here we should see different addresses. Now, how big did I say an integer was in C++? Does anybody know how big a, uh, an integer type is? Four bytes. So, um, yeah, so in this case, uh, when I, so did we look at the addresses yet? Um, I printed out some addresses. Yeah, so the addresses is, um, they're hexadecimal uh, numbers of basically indexing where something exists in memory. So if I add plus one to an, uh, a pointer of type int, it's really going to move me over four bytes because it's going to know, oh yeah, move over by one int. And so we're going to see it adding four to the addresses um, of array. And then I, we're going to go through and see all the addresses of the elements in the array. And of course, we're going to go through and see the values also. So again, as I discussed, the brackets operator is going to let us dereference something at the beginning of the array. And this is really what the brackets operator it looks like under the hood. It's, it's adding something, um, the number we give the brackets, and then dereferencing it at the same time. So when I print this, uh, we should see, OK, so we're getting the value of 10. No problem. Now this is a pretty nasty address here, but this is where the beginnings of the first element of the array. So the next element should technically exist. Uh, I just want to zoom in a little. Yeah, okay, so the next element is really just going to exist four bytes over, shifted on the stack. Um, so that's why we're going from uh, blah, 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 30 to blah, 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 34. And then the next element is going to be at 38, and then uh, adding four to eight is going to give you 12. 12 in hexadecimal is C, so we get 3C. So this is, these are all just four byte segments. Um, and there's four of them because our array consists of four values. So of course, I can print off the end of the array, but we're not going to do that right now. And if I wanted to uh, access the actual values in the array, um, I can index as we would in a, pretty much any other language with zero here. And I can, so, so we know that um, array plus one is going to be the address of the second element, right? Or the element at the first index, zero, one. Um, and if I just want the value of that, I can wrap all this uh, in the with the dereferencing operator. So for shorthand, I can I can use the brackets, of course, and that's going to give me six, seven, eight, nine. Um, so there's really uh, the, one of the, the things to realize here is that there's really no way to just like print a single value in C++ and have it have have it print the entire array out to the terminal or something like that. You're going to have to like make an, a function or overload some operator. Um, in like an array class or, so, or something like that to actually go through and print all the values because just printing the value of the uh, array we set is really just going to print the address of the first item in it and of course we can loop through that as much as we want um, so another takeaway here is that if I just have the value array I really don't know where the end of this array is right I mean this like the compiler is going to let me go outside the bounds of this array and keep snooping around different four byte segments of memory uh, I'm looking at things. So pretty much any time you have the just array value, the array primitive in, in C++, um, you're going to have to be given a length alongside of it or else you pretty much don't know when to stop. Because like in Python, if I wanted to um, index outside of this thing, so I have array here. So 7 is at index 0, 8 is at 1, 9 is at 2, 10 is at 3. So if I wanted to say array 4, it's going to yell at me, right? Index out of range. Um, so it kind of keeps track of some of this information f for me. I think is there a is it a function? It's not length. Length. It's length. You got length. Yeah. yeah so it's a function. Yeah. Wow. Yay! So so it, it's going to know some more information about this um, this array. There's all kinds of different functions that you can kind of use with the array and operators that are overloaded in other languages. Uh, in C++, as we as we saw, all I have is the pointer to the first element. And you're kind of made responsible of keeping track of the length of it so that you know that you can give this array and the length to any user, any consumer of the array, and that they're not going to run off the end because you've told them the proper bounds. Um, so is that kind of clear what an array is and, and how it be their analogies to pointers? Is anybody confused on that? Cool. So the next example I have is uh, pass by reference and pass by value. It's really pass by pointer and pass by value. But Zach talked about this a little. So if, um, as an example, if I wanted to pass something into a function and I wanted to mutate that, the, the value, and then I go outside the function back to where I was, that value change that I made inside that function is not going to persist outside the lifetime of that function. And we're going to talk about that why, talk about why and how pointers can kind of, I guess, help you get around that. So in this case, I have... Uh, Two functions, um, take value and take pointer. Take value takes just a regular um, 
integer variable called int val into, into the function, and we add 5 to it, right? Plus equals 5, same with set of equals 5. Um, and take pointer is going to pretty much do the same thing, but so we're dereferencing it first, which is going to be the first thing that's evaluated here. Then we're going to add 5 to it. So Zach showed us that that's actually going to mutate the value at the original address that we've been given. Does that kind of make sense where, where that's coming from? Uh, so down here we just have a couple simple tasks we're doing. So we're making a variable called a. We're setting it equal to 10. I'm going to print what a is. So we're going to see 10. I think that's fairly obvious. Uh, and then we're going to call take value and we're going to give it a. So what's going to happen is we're going to go inside the take value function. And then the take value function is going to have this, this variable inside, inside of it that it has access to called int val. And with int val, it can add things, subtract things, so whatever it can from an int. And then we're going to leave that function. We're going to come back, we're going to see what the value of a has already been. So does anybody want to take a guess or what the, what the value of a will be after we call this function? Then, then why is that? You don't actually change it. Yeah. Yeah, so what ha what's happening inside here is really, we go into take value. And take value gets a copy of that, of a. So when we make a copy of a, it's pretty much just setting int val equal to a. So int val is now 10, and a is 10, but they're totally separate. They're, don't, they're, not, they're completely independent memory locations. So if I change one, the change is not going to persist between both of them. So you had that right when you said that. So when we get away, when we get out of take value, we come back to main after take value is finished executing, that value, that copy, value of a called int val is going to be just popped up the stack, which we're going to kind of cover the stack later, but it's basically just going to be removed because it's copied specific to that function, and main is, no, is going to know nothing of it, and any changes we made to int val are just going to be completely meaningless. Um, so if we wanted to actually give a function some arguments that we want to allow the function to mutate, then we'd have to use references or pointers, and since we're doing pointers today, we're just going to cover pointers. Um, so in this case, take pointer pretty much does the exact same thing, but instead of taking uh, something of type int, it, some, it takes something of type pointer to an int. So we know that a um, is an integer, and we can access a's address with the address of operator, the, amp the ampersand. Um, and if we can pass the address of a inside to take pointer. And an int pointer um, is going to inside, so we're going to be having a totally new pointer specific to this function, take pointer function. But the address is still going to be of what really is at a, at a in this case. So we set the address and the value here, and we're giving access uh, to the address inside that function, the int pointer. And then int pointer is going to dereference it and then add 5 to it. So we're going to actually go right to the real address that we know where a exists. And we're going to mutate the value at that address. In this case, we're adding 5 and we're setting it equal to itself added 5. Then we're going to return. So when we come out of this, now A's change is actually going to be persisted. Um, so does anybody know what the value of A is going to be at this point after all of this stuff just right at the end here? 15, yeah. Yeah, so that change is persisted. That's kind of the key thing that we're getting at with, um, with one of Zach's examples, where we were able to set the value of either A or its pointer in this case. But they're both pointing to the same exact memory location. So a change to either value is going to persist between any pointer going to that memory location because it's all centralized at one location. So every time we call take pointer, we're going to be really mutating the value um, of a because int pointer is pointing at a because we didn't just give it the value of a, we gave it the address of a. So now it's going to have uh, some more information on it that it can use to mutate it. Is that kind of clear? The the idea of pass by value and then. That's my pointer. So in take value, I mean, the takeaway is that a, bat, or a copy of whatever we pass in is created. It's only specific to the scope of that function, so you can do anything you want to it. But the second you leave, that's it. Um, so the way, so, so in, in the second function, we use pointers to get around this um, by allowing it to have access to not just a copy, but the actual address of the original that existed outside the scope of that function. So A exists outside that function, and we can make changes to something outside that function as long as we're given the proper credentials, if you will. And that's going to be the address of A. Uh, so we can mutate A in that position. Is that clear? Does that make sense? I'll go ahead and execute this. Uh. 
Okay, so uh, no surprise here. We, we print out A before we call take val. We call take val. A's, any changes inside this take val function, uh, this take value function, did not persist as we expected. A is still 10, untouched. But now we give the take pointer access to the address of this variable. So we can do whatever kind of changes it wants. And in this case, we, we add 5 to it. And then we're outside, outside that function. The change is going to persist since it actually touched the original address of that variable. All right, so our next topic is memory management. You see there's very, very little code right there because until we talk about data structures, which will be later, there isn't too much to say. Uh, but before I talk about memory management and how it works in C++ and C, um, we need to talk about the difference between the stack and the heap. Now, how many of you, show of hands, know, uh, are very confident that you know the difference between the stack and the heap? Not very many. Um, that's expected. Um, so the stack and the heap are both, uh, oh my god, what is the noun that I would use to describe them? They're both just places that your operating system, yeah, they're both blocks of memory that your operating system will use to store memory. Um, but they work differently. I don't even know what I don't know if you want to do well, uh, the point, the general idea is, I don't know what I draw, but I'll take it just in case. Um, so the stack is where most memory that you will allocate goes. And if we look at, say, any one of these other files, like this one right here, all of the memory that we allocate in this, so memory gets allocated every time you declare a new integer or a new pointer, really any time you make a new instance of anything, you uh, allocate some memory, and that memory is going to go on the stack. The way the stack works is the compiler, or the operating system, puts the memory on the stack when it gets to that section of code, and once it goes out of scope, it's popped off the stack. Uh, pretty simple. The, the, the uh, idea behind the stack is that the computer handles it for you. You don't need to worry about it. Um, you've probably heard the term memory leak. Um, if you don't delete memory that you've allocated uh, dynamically, it's a leak. But none of this will leak because as soon as it goes out of scope, which happens when you hit this bracket, uh, the operating system knows to take back all of the memory that you gave the program. <coughs> so. Uh, the different, or the other place your computer has memory is the heap. Uh, it is still RAM memory in exactly the same way, uh, but you allocate memory on the heap using the new keyword. Uh, what the new keyword does, maybe you've seen it before, is give it a type. In this case, we're giving it an array of integers of size 5, and it gives you a pointer. So say we wanted to make a new string. Uh, the variable here would not be of type string, it would be a string pointer. Uh, what the new keyword does is uh, permanently allocate uh, memory for you. Uh, that means even when the memory goes out of scope, so when we hit this bracket and the program's done, uh, this, uh, it doesn't happen on modern operating systems, but um, the computer does not know to take back the memory. You have specifically told the operating system that, no, this memory belongs to me. You can't have it back until I tell you to. Um, and that is not, so it'll cause memory leaks uh, in programs if you don't delete anything that you allocate with new. Um, but in modern operating systems, uh, they know to take back memory after a process ended. But if you're ever working on embedded systems, like the kind of computer that would go in like a dishwasher or something, uh, this is something you need to be very careful about. Of course you need to be careful about it all the time because nobody likes a program that suddenly is taking up seven gigabytes of RAM. Uh, but actually operating systems uh, and embedded systems do not know to take back the memory on their own and they will, you'll actually have to turn them off and back on to give back the memory because RAM is reset. It loses power. So, uh, walking through this real quick, the new keyword, I already went over this. Who can tell me what the new keyword does? In the back. Allocates memory on the stack. Perfect. 
So now, uh, after we've allocated that array, we now own the memory space for five integers. Um, you know, because we gave it size five. So those are going to be almost always uh, back to back. So we own five spaces of memory on the heap. Uh, because we use the new keyword, it goes on the heap instead of the stack. So um, I've already explained this automatic versus dynamic memory. Uh, automatic is what you saw before, where you just declared the variable. Uh, dynamic memory allocation is when you use the new keyword. Um, so uh, because we own the memory, we are responsible for giving it back to the OS uh, using the delete keyword because it, uh, we don't need the memory anymore. And if we keep it sitting around there, we will lose uh, a reference to the memory. But if the program is still going on and the variable that allocated the memory is out of scope, uh, even though we don't have a reference to the memory anymore, we still own the memory. So that's just more memory that your process takes up and the operating system can't have that. Um, so there are two delete operators, the delete and delete with brackets. Only difference here is that we're deleting an array, so it's the brackets. Yeah, so, so if he, uh, can I just add to this a little? Yeah, sure. So um, if we wanted just a straight up new integer, right? Um, I think you said, yeah, so if I want a new int on the heap, it's valid, right? It doesn't like the highlighting. Um, and maybe it's just like a heavy Primitive types don't have, primitive types can't be objects. Yeah. So it would be part of the standard library similar to Java. Okay, I need to see if this works. Well, I'll, I'll do it I don't know. Yeah, I so, think he might be right. Yeah, anyways, um, so if I wanted to um, just make a value, just a single, um, it's like a regular integer, a single value, 5, 10, 100, whatever, um, and I, I didn't want it to, for some reason, store it on the stack. I could store it on the heap. Like, like he's saying, use the, the new um, keyword here and tell the operating system, hey, I need... Uh, some memory of size int. Int is going to be four bytes in this case. Uh, and I'm going to set the value at that address as five. Um, and as, as he said, we have to tell the operating system that that memory cannot be used by other things by deleting it. Um, but if we wanted to have an array of something on uh, on the heap, so let's go back to his example, new call. So we can have a new, a new array of um, five elements, right? Um, and if I just deleted R, what has anybody have an idea of what this is going to be doing under the hood? If I just delete ARR once I actually allocate um, the space for five integers on the heap. So if I were to just print out, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I'm assuming because you asked the question, it only removes the first. Yeah, that's it. That's perfect. Because ARR is just going to be the address of the very first element in the array. So if I delete ARR, we're technically leaving four other integers that the operating system is not aware that it can have back. So we're really leaking memory technically. Um, so the operating system is going to keep track of kind of how large of a block we want in, in the heap. And so if we wanted to delete several contiguous things at once um, without, so instead of saying delete R, delete um, R plus one. Second or, yeah. Yeah, um, plus one. Yeah, I, I, yeah. So if we wanted, yes, yeah, so we could say delete r, delete r plus one, r plus two, r plus three, and, and we could go forever, really, as long as our array is. Um, this is tedious because we have a contiguous block of elements on the heap that the operating system has given us. So instead, we can let the OS kind of take care of that and say, yeah, we have an array. Delete all the elements and, and take all the um, all the val the very sorry all the memory that you gave us access to. You can have it all back with the delete brackets uh, operator. So if we have a single thing. We could just use the delete, but the delete brackets is useful for arrays and things like that. Um, so another way of allocating memory that maybe you've seen before is malloc uh, works not quite as nicely as new. malloc is the way you allocated memory, and C new is new as plus plus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, malloc, uh, just a quick rundown. Instead of just writing the new keyword like that, uh, it's a function you pass how you pass in. The parameter takes us how many bytes of memory you want. Do you want me to do it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right now. And, uh, Can I pass it an int? I don't know how that, or just four. Yeah, four. 
Um, and then you tell how many bytes you want, and it returns a void pointer, which is a pointer of no type, basically, uh, that you can cast to. Well, you need to actually get the reference. You can delete it and free it. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's just another way of allocating memory. Uh, you probably won't see that as much anymore, and you can never use it with an object because who knows how big an object's going to be. But you can use it too. So it's about free. Yeah. Well, and then uh, the equivalent or of delete for when you use malloc is just free. So F R E D and whatever you want to get rid of. So in C++, you're going to be using um, new, okay, new and delete, whereas in C, I mean, you, you could use malloc and free, um, but it's a little nastier, and this is, so new and delete are, are not going to be a thing in C. It's not going to know what you're talking about when you try to do this. So new and delete are kind of uh, slightly high, higher level malloc and free, or malloc and free, and it lets us do a little bit nicer, have a, have a little nicer syntax for heap allocation and things like that. Um, so uh, I know right now it's probably really hard to see what the hell the point of dynamically allocating memory is. All we're doing here is making an array and then deleting it. Well, it's a point. You can do it the normal way. Um, and it will become a lot more clear as we talk about data structures and stuff like that. And sometimes uh, you won't technically see the pointer in a scope. Uh, but you'll have maybe a list, and at the end of the list, you point to that object, whatever. That'll become more clear. But one example um, that one variable size array. Yeah. Uh, so one example that you that's uh, possible, you can probably understand now, is uh, if you are you know, taking input from the command line from standard in um, of the size of an array to allocate. Uh, so. I guess I didn't really mention this earlier. The stack does have a maximum size. Uh, of course, so does the heap. Uh, it's what, however much memory your computer has. But the stack isn't you know, the same size as your RAM. And eventually, if you allocate too much memory on the stack, if you go too deep in recursion, or you know, just put a variable that's outlandishly big, like say you want an array of size 4 billion. Uh, Do you, you want me to write a quick example of the variable size? Right? Yeah, sure. Uh, you might run out of stack space and that causes stack overflow, which will totally screw up your program and maybe even blue screen your computer and you'll have to reboot or something, terrible things. Uh, so one thing you can do to prevent against that is dynamically allocating memory. Um, instead of putting the memory on the stack and hoping that you have enough stack space to deal with it, um, you can take in and, you know, integer from standard in and as long as you can allocate, as long as you have the RAM and swap space to uh, store that, you can store pretty much as much information as you want on the heap. Your computer won't run out. Yeah, so the, the reason this example is kind of dangerous is because we're allowing the user to give us the size of an array. And so the stack is really, really small, typically, compared to the heap. So they can technically give us a number that's so big, we're going to uh, overflow the stack. And the, the stack is for our computer or for our program to run. So the program's not going to run once we've overflowed the stack. So if we want to make something really, really big and be really secure about it so that the user can, uh, so we can guarantee that the array is going to fit and not make our, our program break, then... I don't think that even compiles in C++. Well, it would compile, you just hit a seg fault when you try to run something that doesn't need to run. Yeah. Yeah. What? Can't, yeah, you can't use that. You can't use that in C++. Why? I think you can. Run it. Okay. The seg fault is because it doesn't know how to handle this too much memory. Yeah. Well, if I give it not enough or not too much. I just think you could dynamically just vary the size of that. Yeah, you, I think you can. No, it's A, right? Yeah, no, that definitely works. Huh. You, you can have variable size arrays on the stack. The danger is that you can overflow the stack, unfortunately, like pretty easily if you give it something too big. Because the stack is really small and it's supposed to be really quick because it's trying to make our program run fast. So the heap is like this big, slow blob of memory that we can just throw anything at or keep anything at. So if I wanted to have a humongous array that is not going to be dangerous to my stack, this is where the heap comes in. So we still want to have this, the, the size of the array that we want. Um, and then we want to say, okay, I want to have, uh, 
Oh, how's this going to work? But but for the new size. Um, int for int pointer array. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Int equals new int of size. So in this case, we're going to actually tell the operating system, hey, give me whatever this size happens to be, because we don't have to know it. Yeah, yeah. So whatever size we want it to do, uh, it's going to let us do this at runtime. Um, the operating system is going to give us this memory, assuming it has the memory to give in contiguous space. Um, and so now we can have a humongous array without worrying about popping the stack or uh, overflowing the stack. And of course, if this is really, really big, or even if it's really small, we always want to delete it um, with the brackets operator. We want to delete array so that we can say, okay, give this back to the operating system. So it's going to behave more or less the exact same. If I want something of size uh, you know, 5, it's going to do it, and then it's going to give the operating system a lot to go back. Um, so there's, there's a cool program. We talked about memory leaks a little bit. Is now a good time to talk around, I guess. Yeah. So we talked about memory leaks uh, and stuff like that. And it's the idea of claiming memory from the operating system, but never telling the operating system it can have that memory back. So if I did not delete this, this program here is, is leaking memory. If I say I want an array on the heap of size 5, it's just we're, the operating system doesn't know that our program is, you know, it's not, well, okay, probably does in some cases. But we have to assume that the operating system doesn't know that that memory can be reclaimed. So in this case, there's a program for, uh, oh, do I even have it on here? Nope. Yeah, um, Great. I don't know if it's on the girl. <laughs> there's a program called Valgrind, and it actually kind of sits outside your program and, and keeps track of everything you knew and everything you delete. And at the end of your program, when it's running, um, when your program is done running, does it have it? No. <laughs> cool. Or if you're running commands, right? I have no idea what you're talking about. What? Valgrind. It works. It does not just repeat what it's like. Right, yeah, yeah. So it sits, but it's gonna, if I used it, it's going to sit outside of my, um, my program, and it's going to say, hey, did this guy delete everything he knew? And in this case, I didn't. I, I don't have the delete operator. It's going to let me know, hey, your program has a memory leak. Here's how many bytes your operating system definitely lost. Um, fix it, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and so it's something to, to use if you're on a Unix-based operating system. Of course, I don't have it installed. But that's convenient. But basically, you would, instead of just running the executable like this and then like going through it, you just run valgrind and then the executable. And it's going to run the executable under valgrind. So valgrind can kind of watch the memory management. And we just leak more memory. But um, So if I wanted to delete this array, of course, we did, we did the deletes uh, brackets operator. And uh, yeah. Um, Valgrind, if I ran it with Valgrind, it would tell us that we did not leak any memory. You have the same number of freeze as you, as you have deletes or news. It says freeze for some reason on Valgrind. Um, and it's going to let us know that we actually did not leak memory. So is that kind of clear uh, how we can allocate things on the heap and maybe why we might want to? Yes. So the memory that you deleted or allocated on the first few times you ran the program? It's still like locked up, isn't it? Yeah, um, I, on a monitor. On a, this is a problem. No, your computer's okay to handle it. Your computer knows when a process ends, and it. Uh, modern operating systems are smart enough to say like, oh, well, this process allocated these blocks of memory, so uh, when it's done, that this is what I should uh, reclaim when the process is over. But typically, you never want to assume that yeah. the operating system so, knows unless you explicitly tell it. Put the burden of freeing that memory on you, not the operating system. Let's say you go to a co-op and you're working on this big program that runs for two hours at a time, sometimes longer. If you put a memory leak in that, it won't catch that. And that's where these memory leaks really come into play, is in the bigger applications and things that have a lifetime. Yeah, some servers never stop running. Yeah. So if you have a server that never stops running and every hour it leaks four bytes, you give it enough time and, and the operating, it's just going to crash. The computer's going to crash, it's going to have to reboot, all the memory's going to be reclaimed and your server's down for something how long it takes. Notice. <laughs> yeah. So memory leaks are important to catch, even if it doesn't matter too much in your uh, little programs like this. If you're ever working on you know, an actual program that'll be up for longer than two seconds, you do need to be very careful about memory leaks because you can very quickly lose all of your RAM. Any questions? Uh, well, how does it do uh, stack overflow? If you what? If you stack overflow. If you run out of it? Yeah. 
Um, you're gonna. I've never tried. We did. Um, we did it in data structures. I can't remember. Um, I don't know. Uh, you get an error. Your your program stops. Like that's it. Yeah. You get a seg fault. It's a seg fault. If you like to try to tried to declare an array that was too big, you get a seg fault on the stack. On the heap, it, it's hard. Well, I don't know what happens if you run out of memory on the heap. You never try it. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the same as a memory leak. Your computer would just stop working. Yeah. Spin up a VM and try it. Or don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it on your native operating system. Okay. You ready for me to go on? Do we have the time? Do we want to? Um, yeah, I'll do a little bit. Um, so we so, had a question about, you know, when would I use a yeah. pointer versus when would I use a variable? I mean, these are very academic examples, like one int. So obviously, we have the space on it for the stack. So in what case would I not want to use uh, a pointer? Why, why could I just, you know, use ints and stuff like that? So yeah. Kurt's going to talk about that. So I'll keep this short, and we'll leave time for questions. So when should you and when shouldn't you use a pointer? Because we just looked at it, and we talked about the difficulties mm -hmm. of memory management. Um, think about you're writing a program. If anytime you use the new, new keyword, you need to delete it. So I just got in trouble in a code review because I had a memory leak because I was in a function redefining a variable uh, with the new keyword and not deleting what was there yes. before. So I got a little bit of uh, I got some red, red lines in the code yeah. review for that. So there are some uh, yeah I can't spell. So th there's reasons, there are valid reasons to use pointers, but in modern C++, a lot of the time you should really avoid it. Um, and I talk about some of those reasons why you should, and honestly, they're a little complex in some cases. So um, a lot of the time, like we talked about, uh, the, mem the operating system can handle just fine your object. Um, there are some cases where you might not, and one of those cases is when you want polymorphic behavior. Uh, for those of you that have had object-oriented and you're familiar with that, um, that's a concept with that which we will definitely go into when we get to that. Um, so that's a valid reason why you might. Um, some functions, you might be using a library, especially some C libraries or some C++ libraries that require you to pass a pointer in. In some of those cases, it's unavoidable, and that is definitely a valid case to use it. Another one, um, which I don't like, is that you can forward declare classes with pointers. Another very edge use case, but a valid one. It can save you some compile time. Um, and what else? I had one other thing up here um, that I wanted to talk about. Oh, I know. You scroll down a little bit for me. So Here's Dom, talk, Dom talked about uh, passing by reference and passing by value. Um, but one of the things we kind of skipped over because uh, it falls outside of the scope of pointers a little bit is the reference operator, which is the ampersand. Um, you can actually use that to pass by reference. So if you want the behavior of passing something in by reference so that if it's mutated in the function, the actual variable is mutated as well, then you can accomplish that with a pointer. But in modern C++, there's an even better way of doing that that doesn't require you to deal with uh, dynamically allocating memory and deleting that memory, and that is using the reference operator, which they use um, to show you how you could get the address of a variable. That works just fine, and if you scroll down to my definition here, I don't have to worry about pointers at all. So if I had declared my int with the new keyword, which you can't do, but um, if I had an object, I don't need to worry about deleting it. It works just fine. So most of the time, you can get away just fine without using pointers. But you're going to go on co-op, and if you have to deal with C++, you're going to find pointers. You're going to find a lot of people using them. And there are legitimate cases where you need to define something in the heap rather than the stack. Um, and you need to let something to outlive its scope. Uh, and those cases, you do want to use a pointer. So it's important to understand it. But it's not also a catch-all tool for everything. Um, do you guys disagree with me on anything I said? No? OK. So um, without further ado, it's 7.07, .07, so we did pretty good on time. So uh, if you have feedback on this, uh, I am more than happy to hear it. Come up and talk to me if you don't want to say it in front of everybody. If you have questions, uh, you can ask them in a second or come up and talk to us after. We are happy to answer your questions. Um, and third, I just want to mention that this is not an official ACM meeting, so if you're concerned with your attendance for voting at the end of the semester, this doesn't count, so you'll have to come to other ACM meetings, and that's also why, unfortunately, we don't have food. So, uh, any questions about the subject matter? Any comments on the direction? We're going to keep going with these workshops, these kind of reviews. How do you guys like the code and kind of work, walking through the code? Do you like that? Would you prefer slides? Nobody's, okay. Nobody says they prefer slides. I don't blame you. I, I like <laughs> code more, too. So, uh, any comments or questions on pointers? Nick. 
in some methods, I remember like overloaded methods like copy constructors, you needed to pass by reference. Uh huh. Do you know why that is? Well, you don't really. Yeah, it, it was a syntax error if I tried to pass by pointer, or if I tried to just pass the object itself. It needed to pass by. Yeah, reference. copy constructor needs a reference. Okay. And some of the over. Do you know why they need them, or is that I just the syntax? I guess it's just the syntax. Okay. I'm not sure. Yeah, there isn't actually a difference other than references. We went to see more C++ stuff. Yeah, so where we're planning on going from here. Uh, data structures, the standard library. Um, algorithms. Algorithms down the road after those. Uh, and those are kind of the things we're looking at focusing on. Um, things like strings and iterators and then moving on towards data structures, your standard maps, your vectors, all your things like that that are definitely very useful, as opposed to just ints. Not that ints aren't useful, but you can actually use them. The world is built on the <laughs> ints. So, uh, any questions? OK. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Do either of you have anything else? Yeah, just if you have anything to ask, feel free to come